If you support a revolution, you have to be willing to accept the utter uncertainty of its outcome. You won't get to dictate or even predict how much or exactly how things change. Your options are to defend the status quo, even if you believe in reform, or to destroy the established order and accept the free-for-all which follows. These were lessons that Scotland learned the hard way during the time of the British Civil Wars. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsalvola, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. Scotland certainly wanted things to change during the reign of King Charles I. They were staunch Presbyterians living under kings who wanted to push them toward Episcopalianism. Taxes had increased, and they weren't getting as much attention as England, even though the Stuarts were Scottish kings who had taken the English throne, rather than vice versa. And these problems were only getting worse. By the time war broke out in England, it had already been going on in Scotland for years, off and on, and alliances were already shifting. Unlike England, Scotland was largely ideologically united, and there was little debate over which political or religious future to choose. Scots had a largely uniform vision explicitly stated in a document called the Covenant, and the question facing the country was how to protect that vision while the King and Kirk, or Scottish Presbyterian Church, played political tug-of-war with the country. Defending the Covenant became the Scottish majority's focus during the Civil War. This majority was known as the Covenanters, and it was led by Archibald Campbell, Marquess of Argyll. Its opposition consisted of a handful of Catholics and Episcopalians, as well as a group of moderate Covenanters who had started to question Argyll's motives. These people were led by James Graham, Marquess of Montrose. These were the groups who would rally behind the royal standard. So far, though, they had been imprisoned, intimidated, and many driven to England, while the ones who remained were just trying to keep their heads down. Montrose himself had been imprisoned, but he'd been released the previous November when the king visited Edinburgh. Now he begged Charles to allow him to fight for him in Scotland. The Earl of Antrim, leader of the Irish rebels in Ulster, was even willing to send him an Irish army for the fight. The king was hesitant, though. As the Marquess of Hamilton pointed out, if Scotland entered the war, it would be on Parliament's side, so it benefited the king to keep Scotland neutral as long as possible. The Covenanters were demanding that England commit to adopting Presbyterianism in exchange for a military alliance, and that wasn't happening. The last thing that Charles needed was to prematurely push them into that alliance, which could provide Parliament with tens of thousands more experienced troops. Hamilton may have been too weak, and he certainly sympathized with the Covenanters, but this was definitely a fair argument. The problem, though, is that when that alliance was forged, Montrose was totally unprepared. So ten months after the war began, Argyll and Henry Vane, among others, met in Edinburgh and negotiated a treaty known as the Solemn League and Covenant. Now, you and I both know Henry Vane at this point, and in fact, I'd venture a guess that we know him better than just about anyone does. And we certainly know him well enough to know that he was never going to actually agree for England to adopt uniform Presbyterianism. But he was nothing if not clever, and under his guidance, 
the Solemn League and Covenant was cleverly warded to avoid doing so. It forged a military alliance, it agreed to make religion in both countries uniform, and it even discussed the possibility of uniting the two kingdoms, but it kept the wording vague about precisely what the religious future of the two countries would be. And for one reason or another, Argyle didn't call him on it. When a group of royalists in Scotland tried to rebel against this, the Scottish Kirk had excommunicated them, and the Parliament had chosen one, convicted him of treason by attainder, and beheaded him, so people were more than reluctant to follow in those footsteps. And ten months after the Solemn League and Covenant was signed, a Covenanter army under David Leslie enabled Parliament's victory at Marston Moor, the turning point of the English Civil War, saving a wounded Oliver Cromwell and helping to hold the Royalist line. Leslie had fought brilliantly for Sweden in the Thirty Years' War and returned with the esteemed Alexander Leslie to turn the Covenanter army into a professional fighting force during the Bishops' Wars. Now, this same army all but clinched Parliament's victory, and Montrose was still stuck in London. But since neutrality was no longer an option, King Charles now let him do his thing. Antrim sent him that army while he made his way north with a few hundred soldiers from England. At this point, the hope was that he could distract Leslie's army, pulling him back up to Scotland so that the English Parliament was forced yet again to fight on its own. It took one showdown with the Scots to scatter the English troops, and by the time that Antrim's forces came down to Montrose, they were shocked to find him alone in the woods, save for two companions, and dressed in humble mountaineering garb. The person leading Antrim's troops was Alistair McCullough, that young MacDonald we met last episode who had been taking refuge in Ireland since Argyle had imprisoned his family. His military career had begun when he had joined the army raised to try to suppress Irish rebels who were at this point slaughtering Ulster Scots. But after just four months, he had defected and joined the rebels who had now organized into the Irish Confederation. He had way more in common with them, and that's pretty indisputable. They shared a language, a religion, and the common experience of having lost and suffered for that religion. The McDonald's had been connected to Antrim for centuries, and McCullough had even been born there, as had his father. Even the Campbells could be seen as a common enemy. McCullough was soon such a distinguished leader of the Confederate forces that Antrim chose him to lead the Irish army that would fight in Scotland. And he was a spectacular choice. Together, Montrose and McCullough achieved what neither could have done separately. They took Scotland for the king. If the story were fiction, people would be right to dismiss it as being unrealistic. Two people, both in their early 30s with a couple years military experience each, Montrose brought education, formal military training, experience plotting large-scale campaigns, the legitimacy of being the king's designated leader, and a dedication to Presbyterianism. McCullough brought Highland prestige, Highland connections, and the specific experience of fighting as part of an underdog rebel force, with battlefield tactics to match, plus the beginnings of an army. Perhaps most importantly, though, they shared an almost unequaled willingness to risk and do what it took to win. The importance of that can't be understated. No one who fought alongside Montrose and McCullough 
was likely to survive a defeat, them included. Irish people were exempted from quarter, even when offered, and McCullough was essentially an Irish rebel, leading an army of indisputable Irish rebels. His military experience had come from fighting Scots, killing Scots, kicking them off the land, and revolutionizing the type of warfare used against them. And he was a Catholic. As for Montrose, he had been excommunicated by the Kirk, and the Scottish Parliament had passed a bill of attainder against him, so if he were ever captured, he would be executed. Together, they led an army of 3,000 Irish and Highlander soldiers with no cavalry, little training, and even less equipment. Meanwhile, the Covenanters could easily recruit tens of thousands of soldiers. In Ireland, McCullough had helped develop the tactic which would become the foundation of their fighting style, and which would come to be known as the Highland Charge. It's a fascinating tactic, and just so representative of the nature of their army, too. Instead of surrounding their musketeers with pikemen to protect them while they reloaded, McCullough's soldiers would stand just outside of accurate firing range to push the enemy to shoot. Most of the bullets would miss, and while they were reloading, his troops would run up to the pikemen, shoot at point-blank range, and then finish them off with swords before they could organize to fight back. It would be a century before guns were fast enough to make this strategy obsolete. And much like the Highland Charge, Montrose and McCullough's victory would be built on speed, cleverness, and sheer audacity, along with a hefty enough dose of violence to make the English Civil War seem tame by comparison. In part, this was cultural because massacres were a part of Highland life and clan feuds, and the bitterest feud in Scottish history was between Argyle's Campbells and McCullough's McDonald's. Even one of the Campbells who was now leading a Covenanter army had orchestrated a massacre of 3,000 McDonald's just a few years before. In addition to this, there had already been an escalation of brutality during the Bishop's Wars. But the level of violence was also a result of the fact that Montrose's army was a tiny one, fighting a massive, well-equipped force. And they were all going to be killed if they were ever defeated. Inflicting minimal damage was not a priority, nor was granting quarter in a conflict where none could be expected. This was a fight to the death, and they were the underdogs. Argyle now had to stay behind in Scotland to fight Montrose's army. First, they faced off in Perth, where Argyle had an army of 6,600. Montrose's army won, though, and their victory started with them throwing rocks at their enemy, after which they chased them down with claymores. They killed 300 people and sustained only two minor injuries. After the battle, they stocked up on provisions, weapons, clothes, food, etc., got a couple of reinforcements, and headed to Aberdeen. When they won there, too, Leslie's army had to head back to Scotland. After winning in Aberdeen, Montrose's army went down to Argyleshire and just devastated the Campbells. They killed a thousand people did millions of pounds worth of damage, and burned Inverary to the ground. Argyle himself only narrowly escaped, but he sailed to Inverlochy to regroup and gathered 8,000 troops to surround Montrose's army. The roads leading out of the area went either to Inverlochy or Inverness, and everything else was rugged mountain terrain. And this was the middle of winter, 
So Argyle put 3,000 people in Inverlochy and 5,000 in Inverness. But Montrose and McCullough chose the mountains, and they traveled 30 miles through almost impossible terrain in 36 hours, so that Argyle's Inverlochy army had no warning whatsoever of their approach. They simply looked up one morning to see 1,500 men marching down Ben Nevis. Half their army was killed in the battle, including most of the important Campbell leaders, while Montrose and McCullough lost only a handful of men. And the victories continued, until there was only one remaining Covenanter army in Scotland, a force of 7,000 men at the town of Kilsith, led by William Bailey. This one could easily have defeated them, but it ended up being the most anticlimactic of all. Bailey planned to trap Montrose between his army and the reinforcements which were arriving under Hamilton's brother. And there would have been little that Montrose could do. But in this case, Kirk leadership overruled Bailey. They could do that in the Covenanter army, and they were panicked about the idea of Montrose and McCullough getting back into the Highlands, so they demanded that Bailey rearrange his army to focus on preventing this, as Montrose watched. After arguing all that he could, Bailey obeyed, and all Montrose had to do was attack while they rearranged, and he wiped out three quarters of their army. The rest fled into bogs where more died. The reinforcements scattered. Leadership fled to England and Glasgow and Edinburgh were simple victories after that. Against all odds, Montrose controlled Scotland. He released his friends and supporters from prison, conferred a knighthood on McCullough, and recognized Catholics as being his most dependable and trustworthy soldiers pushing for them to get freedom of worship. I may have dwelled too long on this, but it really is an amazing story. There was just one problem, though, and that was England. Montrose's great victory had come just two months after the king's final defeat at Naseby. News of Montrose's exploits had been the only good news for English royalists in over a year, and now the king had no real army with which to win a war. He was playing for time, delaying the inevitable, and trying to find some way to salvage something. So the question facing Montrose and McCullough was what to do next. They couldn't hold Scotland indefinitely with nothing going on in England, and they weren't going to do much good trying. Charles hoped to meet with them to rebuild his war effort, but fundamentally they were in charge of an army whose numbers hovered between 1,500 and 3,000. They had done the impossible, but there were a lot of people who simply would not fight alongside Irish Catholics who had only recently been killing Scottish Protestants. Montrose wanted to meet with the king and rebuild the royalist war effort, but McCullough wanted to keep weakening the Campbells. They had different priorities, and with the newly changing war dynamics, there was no getting around that fact. As much as Montrose disliked Argyle, he was not going to abandon the king to fight him. And if McCullough's time was limited, he was going to spend that time weakening his clan's greatest rivals. 700 soldiers stayed with Montrose, 2,000 went with McCullough, and the two parted ways. But neither was as strong as they had been together. Leslie gathered the people who had escaped Kilsith and tracked down Montrose. He killed every soldier under his command, as well as the wives who were nearby. Montrose escaped, but no one would join him after that. He tried to meet with Digby at Newark, but neither could reach it. 
and after defeating Montrose, Leslie turned toward McCullough's army. He forced them to retreat to Ireland and then killed the 300 people left behind in Dunaverty Castle. McCullough and his men continued their fight in Munster, but there they too were overwhelmed, defeated, and executed, as was McCullough's imprisoned father in Scotland. Meanwhile, the king had surrendered to the Covenanters, calculating that they were the most likely opponents to negotiate with him. They were clearly being pushed to the side, ignored more and more by England's victorious roundheads, and Scottish Presbyterians disliked the ascending independence of the New Model Army every bit as much as they disliked Episcopalians. As a show of mutual good faith, Charles had ordered his remaining armies, including McCullough's, to stand down, and the Covenanters had allowed Montrose and his followers to escape into exile. That was all they really accomplished, though. Neither was prepared to bend enough to come to an agreement yet. Charles was obviously in the weaker position, but as would become increasingly clear in coming months and years, allying with him was also the best chance that the Covenanters had to protect their own interests. Perhaps neither was willing to accept how dire their situations were, but the treaty fell through and the Covenanters gave Charles to Parliament in exchange for their war debts, £200,000, being paid off. This, though, prompted the next split of the Covenanter cause. Hamilton, who during this time had left the king's service, entered the inner circle of Covenanter leadership, been imprisoned and now been released from prison, now led a faction of Covenanters who were concerned by the direction that things were taking in England. The worst sorts of radicals were taking over, Scotland was being left out of any decision-making, and the Solemn League and Covenant was being thoroughly ignored. England absolutely was not turning Presbyterian, and Scottish speeches were banned from being printed in England. So Hamilton's group of Covenanters started to negotiate with the king, and they were willing to bend a lot more than Argyle's faction had. After some negotiation, they were willing to ally with the king in exchange for three years of Presbyterianism and a say in future religious changes. This treaty was called the Engagement, and its supporters were called Engagers. And the king agreed to their terms. The Engagers took the majority in the next Scottish Parliament, but Argyle and the Kirk still opposed any compromise. Rumors spread ever further that Argyle wanted to be the de facto leader of Scotland, but the fact that the Kirk opposed the engagement soon turned the population against it. More than that, the Kirk also put up roadblocks to hinder Hamilton's progress, saying, for instance, that anyone who refused the covenant should be excluded from the army, and also that they shouldn't fight until the king accepted the full covenant and permanent Presbyterianism. The result of the Kirk's position was that Leslie and other experienced covenanter officers refused to serve in the Engager army, and recruitment of ordinary soldiers was painfully slow, and English royalists who were waiting had enough desperation and little enough trust in Hamilton that they ultimately decided to stop waiting and rebel on their own. When they did that, Hamilton had only 14,000 untrained, ill-equipped, and undisciplined soldiers split into two completely different groups. The bad decisions added up and continued to fuel English suspicion, communication never happened, and the war was pretty much over before it began. When Cromwell and Hamilton did face off, a huge part of Hamilton's army fled or surrendered, and Hamilton himself was taken prisoner. This was called the Battle of Preston, 
And after it, there were a significant number of English and Scottish prisoners sent to Barbados, as well as being put to work on English projects around Europe. The problem is that we know almost nothing about these people. We don't even know how many there were for sure. Could have been hundreds, could have been thousands. We know that there were about 10,000 Scottish prisoners taken and the transported ones went to Barbados, but that's about it. The stated rule at this point was that only soldiers who had volunteered for service would be transported, but it's fully conceivable that this rule did not apply to Scots. And one parliamentary officer did say, I think they mean to transport the whole nation of the Scots. It was in this same year that Cromwell, in his infamous conquest of Ireland, also started to transport Irish prisoners en masse to the Caribbean. And there, they were put to work on the emerging sugar plantations as the commonest of indentured servants. Regardless of how many were sent, we can call this the start of Scottish and Irish presence in the colonies. At the same time, within Scotland, the western counties had rebelled against the politically dominant engagers, and soldiers were now marching on Edinburgh to expel them from office. They surrendered too, and anyone who had supported the engagement was now forced to apologize and forbidden from serving in government. This was called the Whigamore Raid. It sealed the fate of the Engager movement, and it's from this event that the Whig Party would later get its name. The new government now welcomed Cromwell into Edinburgh as the deliverer of the Kirk, and he met with Argyll. Royalists would later believe that it was here that the two agreed to the king's execution. But if Argyll had supported the regicide, he was in the distinct minority in Scotland. 